Thank you for joining our event again. I can see some of you were already here yesterday. Uh, some of you are new, new names <laughs> uh, or new, uh, in, um, new faces. Thank you again for connecting and for joining our event um, organized by, by uh, the Center for Global Studies, part of the SESH program where everybody is, most of, our, or most of you working already. Um, my name is Irina Veliku. Uh, together with Marisa Gonzalez, uh, we organized this event and we invited, we have the honor to present our, our guests from yesterday and today. Katerina Teiwa. Um, I'm going to present a little bit her, her work and um, the other guests that we have for today and present to you very briefly the agenda, what to expect from today. Um, and then we can start. So um, Katerina is a professor at, uh, of Pacific Studies uh, in the School of Culture, History and Language at the Australian University, National University. Uh, as she wonderful told us yesterday, her personal history was born and raised in Fiji. It is one of the Banaban Te Tabi Te Wan and African American heritage. She will present to us a little bit uh, an introduction, a summary of her work. But just to, to say uh, two words, um, she her research focuses on the history of phosphate mining in Oce Oceania. Uh, connecting environmental activism with arts and culture. And today we'll detail this part of her work more with us sharing uh, in, a, in a sort of an interactive debate using the, the platform, as you already know. Um, uh, she's practicing artist touring research based uh, on multimedia exhibition, the project Banaba that she only briefly introduced um, yesterday curated by uh, Yuki Ihara. Uh, and finally, she, she was uh, again the teacher of the year uh, last year at the University of National uh, Australia University. Uh, I guess that was my work. I will stop here and uh, I will invite Katerina to, to take uh, the lead of the moderation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Irina. And um, um all the colleagues uh, who are gathered here today. And thank you again for having me um, engage with you. And I'm sorry that I'm not there in Portugal um, one day, hopefully one day, um, but I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Nunawal and the Nambri people here in Canberra, the Australian Capital Territory in Australia. And uh, just want to acknowledge their ancestors and their elders past and present and um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land that I live and work and I've been raising my family on. Um, so lovely to meet you all. And thank you so much for everyone for your contributions to the Padlet as well. I use, uh, I love using Padlet now in my, in my teaching and as a way of, um, Getting to learn a bit more uh, from my students about, you know, their particular interests and the different ways in which we can bring our own histories, our own values, our own um, family and cultural experiences together in one space. So I learned about Padlet from my students. They were like, oh, what are you trying to do in, in class? Here's a platform where you can just do all of this together. And I was like, oh, wow, look at this. Um, so I always invite my, um, my students to take the lead and to actually guide us in, in my tutorials because I learn as much of sometimes even more from them than what they're learning from me. And for me, that is part of the joy of, of being an academic. I'm a very teaching uh, focused academic because I love, I love teaching. It's one of the most um, wonderful aspects for me of being an academic. So before I begin though, I thought it would be nice to, to just show one of the prompts that I shared with everyone, um, just as a way of getting us all in, into an Oceania and kind of an island mindset. And it's a poem 
that my sister wrote, my elder sister wrote, um, and she has now passed away and I've become the custodian of her creative works. Um, my sister was an amazing writer and she was always writing poetry or writing something. She spoke uh, many languages. I don't have her skills. <laughs> in any way, shape or form. She, she, she spoke, uh, you know, English, Fijian, Kiribati language. She spoke French and Spanish. I have no idea how she learned these languages because we were raised under the same roof, but she had an amazing um, skill with words particularly, and that really shaped um, her career and her impact on um, Pacific communities, Pacific students, Pacific feminists, all kinds of uh, communities. She had this amazing impact on them because she cared about so many things and was an amazing teacher herself. So she was always writing, she was always putting words down. And so I was asked to um, read this poem as part of a project which was launched at COP, at COP in Egypt by uh, Mana Moana uh, Pacifica Voices. So they, they launched it um, in Egypt as part of the Pacific uh, participation and intervention into the climate change um, discuss discussions in Egypt. So there were many, many Pacific Islanders on the ground in Egypt and they were sharing uh, the work of their poets and their artists and their activists and their scholars there on the ground. But probably in quite marginalized spaces, uh, unfortunately, in terms of those uh, meetings. Shall we make island a verb? As a noun, it's so vulnerable to impinging forces. Let us turn the energy of the island inside out. Let us island the world. Let us teach the inhabitants of planet Earth how to behave as if we were all living on islands. For what is Earth but an island in our solar system? An island of precious ecosystems and finite resources. Finite resources, limited space. The islanded must understand that to live long and well, they need to take care. Care for other humans, care for plants, animals, care for soil, care for water. Once islanded, humans are awakened from the stupor of continental fantasies. The islanded can choose to understand that there is nothing but more islands to look forward to. Continents do not exist, metaphysically speaking. It is islands all the way up, islands all the way down, islands to the right of us, islands to the left. Yes, there is a sea of islands, and sea can be a verb, just as ocean becomes a verb of awesome possibility. But let us also make island a verb, it is a way of living that could save our lives. Um, I picked all the, all the, um, many of the designs that were uh, there in in the um, poem and I I've been thinking a lot about how to visualize um, my sister's poetry as a much larger project of sharing um, her work and her writing with with the wider world. Um, so this kind of practice is something that I have always been engaged with in the academy. Um, my, I, I was one of those um, students who was much better um, with embodied things, with visual things, with performing, 
um, with practical things and words were not my strong point. So becoming an academic and a scholar in the social sciences and humanities was a really challenging thing for me. Um, I was much more com comfortable with other modes of knowledge production. But the interesting thing was that I didn't want to go into the arts per se to practice these things because that would have been the logical um, thing to do. Like if you want to do artistic things, go be in the arts. I wanted the arts to have real um, uh, power along with other kinds of knowledge production in the social sciences and the humanities. I wanted embodied knowledge, visual knowledge, performing knowledge, emotional knowledge, practical knowledge to have that same status of the written word because we come from non-textual cultures in the Pacific where all our knowledge has been recorded through the visual, through the embodied, through the oral, through performances, through material culture, through architecture and other forms. So I actually rail quite a lot against uh, dominant modes of, of knowledge production in the social sciences hum humanities, particularly in the form of text. So I wanted our activity today to be this combination of visuals and writing um, and for that, you know, to kind of uh, disrupt what, what we in the academy are expected to do, which is write 8,000 word articles or write entire books, write something really, really long that is organized from left to right and top to bottom. And, you know, and we are given the rules and structures around how our, how excellence uh, in, in knowledge production is, is, is judged. So I have been questioning you know, that for a long time. And when I used to do my, um, when I would go into my postgraduate classes, um, you know, in history or in anthropology, and I was given an assignment by teacher and they, they would say, write a 3000 word essay. I would give them drawings <laughs> instead. I would draw things, I would make cartoons, I would do other things just to kind of like test and push the boundaries. Um, of my teachers and say, you know, why, why can't you accept this instead of the essay? And, this, you know, this is problematic in the Western Academy where there are certain rules about um, excellence and rigor um, in our forms of knowledge production, but I'm not sure that they have always helped us. Um, so in this poem, um, To Island the World, you know, it really centers our way of oceanic thinking in the Pacific. Um, not so much in terms of the vulnerability of small island states, which is what some might assume, but in terms of relating to our environments in ways of deep care, of deep concern, not for the environments as something separate from us, but as something that's deeply connected to us. And that's what I talked a lot about um, yesterday for those of you who were able to come to the lecture about the, the connections between Pacific Islanders and their lands, uh, Pacific Islanders and their oceans and the way of thinking about belonging so that the, the, the human, the, uh, the person, the community is deeply connected to the environments that they live in, which is, you know, a basic value for many Indigenous people, but it's often something that's really, really hard for others to understand unless you subscribe to those same kinds of um, values. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen just for a little bit, and then um, we can have a wider um, discussion about the Padlet. Um, this might Take a couple minutes, just let me know if you can see um, the screen okay. Um, so I'm just gonna talk really briefly about my artistic practice, um, which is focused on um, Banaba and the histories, the phosphate mining histories of Banaba and why I felt so um, inspired and driven to transform my research into multimedia um, exhibitions. So, of course, the arts, as I mentioned, uh, poetry, music, dance, these are things 
where our knowledge was recorded and passed on to generations over thousands of years. We didn't have writing in the Pacific. So these forms of knowledge production were the main forms of knowledge production. And these have always been the forms that I was most comfortable with in terms of how I was raised in Fiji with music and dance and art and those sorts of things. So I just never felt comfortable um, even though I learned how to do it very well, I never felt comfortable with writing in the academy, as especially in English, as the dominant um, and accepted form of knowledge production. So I decided early on that my research about my island and about my families had to be presented in other ways to wider audiences, because um, the impacts of phosphate mining is a very global story in that, you know, this small island in the Pacific that belonged to indigenous Bonobans was extracted um, by the British Empire and spread across the fields of Australia and New Zealand and entered the commodity chains that then fed much, much bigger, larger, more powerful countries. But the source of this fertilizer for global agriculture was, was Bonobin land and a few other lands in the Pacific, including from Nauru um, and French Polynesia and so on. So I quickly started to understand that our story was a global story, not just a local story or a Pacific story, and it needed to be shared more widely. But I also had to get people to care, to really care about this story and the kind of damage um, that phosphate mining had done to our environment, including leaving the island without water, without food, you know, without resources, while fueling resources for other parts of the world. So a very, you know, real imbalance of power here in terms of how our lands were utilized um, by much larger, bigger um, global economies. So I turned my research about Banaba into an art exhibition. So I went into the archives, I took, you know, got photographs, I got writing, I got quotes from the archives, and I started to think about how I could creatively share that with much wider audiences. And it was a time when um, universities were thinking a lot about impact. Um, I don't know if it's the same case in Portugal or, you know, in other parts of Europe in terms of your universities expecting your work to have much bigger, much better, much more measurable impact. But it sort of turned out that my interest in the creative arts um, was something that allowed for much bigger impact of my research that otherwise would have been, you know, more kind of like siloed into particular journals or particular books or particular um, forms. Um, so I took all of this knowledge from the archives about our people's history and about our resistance to phosphate mining, and I turned it in to an art exhibition. Um, and I had always visualized and seen it as an art exhibition, you know, going back over 25 years when I was doing my research in anthropology, I thought to myself one day, this will become visual and this will turn into an exhibition. And I was much more excited and inspired by that um, compared with this idea of writing a book, which I still did. Um, so the elements of the exhibition have to do with the content of the research where I had to visualize land and visualize people and think about how to bring those together in time and space and place in different galleries and different kinds of contexts and link that to much broader discussions about our relationships with the environment. And it was um, quite straightforward to do from a Banaban perspective because we are people of the rock. We are kind tiapa, so we belong to the rock. And what's left behind after phosphate mining are these rock formations, these pinnacles, which are like the bones of the land. That is what we belong to. So we have lost our land and what remains behind after you remove the soil from the land are these like bony kind of projections out of the landscape that look like the skeleton of the land. 
that allowed me to think really, really deeply about what we mean by land. Because often people think of land just in terms of the surface, like the soil, like the organic part maybe that you can grow or like the parts where you can build your house or your home, or you think about maybe like the trees and the plants that are on the land, but going much, much deeper, like unless you're a, a soil scientist, <laughs> you know, somebody who like actually studies uh, soil or a geographer or something, people don't tend to go much further than the surface of the land to think about all the different parts of the land, like what is underneath the surface? What is the, the structures? Um, what is the million year process that creates a land or an island in the first place? So I thought really deeply about this down to the molecular, the molecular level. I started thinking about limestone. I think started thinking about calcium carbonates. I started thinking about phosphoric acid. And what, what does that mean and how does that relate to our indigenous concepts of land? What is the relationship between calcium carbonate or calcium phosphate or phosphoric acid and our indigenous notions of belonging to this particular phosphate land? That multi-scalar exercise allowed me to kind of like blow up my thinking about um, our relationship with the environment. So I won't talk much more about it because I'd like to have, you know, a discussion about this and how, how you went about selecting the kinds of stories you wanted to tell um, in Padlet. But a lot of it was very much driven by an idea of loss. And that story of loss is in the article that you had to read from The Guardian. Um, it was kind of the prompt that we were given by the editor of The Guardian who, who commissioned those essays where I wrote about um, Banaba. And because she said, the qu only question I have for you is what are you afraid to lose? What are you afraid to lose in the context of climate change? And I was like, my whole island, <laughs> the whole island. And she was like, oh no, the island is too big. You have to talk about something smaller. And I was like, well, our island is pretty small. It's only six square kilometers. And she was like, can you go a bit smaller? A little bit smaller. And so I had a piece of Banaba in the form of a, of a necklace. Actually, I have it here. I'll go and grab it and I can show it to you. But it's a bit, for me, a very taboo object in that I never wear it. It's like, to me, really taboo to put this piece of Banaba around my neck. And she said, well, can you take a photograph of it and wear it around your neck? I said, nope cannot, not going to wear a piece of banaba around my neck. It's not like a decoration. It's a very taboo and very sacred um, place because of, of the sheer scale of damage, of the sheer scale of colonial extraction that's happened um, to it. So that's what the prompt that we were given to write those essays that you read um, for this exercise. And my, my exhibition kind of shows the loss because if you look at the jagged pinnacles, they are underneath the land. The land should fill in the holes. It should fill in the holes and then you should be able to walk on top, on top of those landscapes. But instead you have to walk in and out of those jagged pinnacles on the ground. So already we have lost something. Um, so I wanted, uh, I wanted to talk about that sense of loss of the landscape, but not like in a victim-y, you know, like we are victims and oh, we you must pity us kind of way, but in more, much more powerful way of thinking about what else do we have to lose on this earth? Because once you, you know, once it's gone, I can't go and get that soil back. I can't get that particular soil back. Maybe I'll get some soil from somewhere else, Maybe I'll, we will fill in the holes using something else, but we will not get those ancestral lands back ever. Those ancestral lands where the bones of our ancestors were buried, they are gone. They have been eaten through the whole commodity chain of global agriculture. That is like forever loss, forever loss. It's like the graves, you know, if somebody went into the graveyards of where your ancestors are buried and dug it all up and fed it to the factories, we will never be able to recover that. 
So that was the prompt that we were given in terms of thinking about um, loss in the context of climate change um, for that exercise. Um, and it is the, you know, it is the basis of, um, of my exhibition, trying to put this um, in global context because there are other, other communities and other peoples that stand so to lose um, so much um, because of climate change. So these are the elements um, of my exhibition, the land and the people and the history together, kind of in an interactive space where people have to read, they have to look, they have to re reflect on all the different elements of the exhibition. Um, so I might just leave it there so that we can have, you know, a bigger um, discussion of the kinds of things that you selected that you selected to share in the Padlet because I use the same prompt um, for the exercise. Um, and I will, let me just see if I can share the Padlet so we can have a discussion of um, what are some of the things you decided to focus on when given the same prompt that the editor of The Guardian gave me. Um, to think about what we stand to lose because of because of climate change and you know sometimes people think oh climate change is like this big thing happening over here and it's happening to everyone in the same way that is not the case climate change is a constellation of things that have already happened <laughs> in dust from the industrial revolution pre-industrial revolution from then all the way till now and uh, global agriculture is a big corner of that. Uh, fossil fuel production and and the emission of um, you know carbon dioxide and all of that from fossil fuels that is a part of it as well. So colonialism and histories of colonial extraction are what creates climate change. It's not like something that's like floating over here that start, suddenly starts happening um, to people on the planet. So phosphate mining is very relevant. Um, to thinking about uh, climate change, for example, and concepts that people are talking about at COP, like loss and damage and all of these things we have to think about, they have to take a historical perspective of that. They have to put loss and damage into historical um, context. 